I like that um, that saying you had in there, because of tradition we know who we are and what God expects us to do. Without traditions, our lives would be as slippery as a biblical roof. Okay, but wait a minute. Wasn't tradition condemned? You hear this a lot, right, from non-Catholic brothers and sisters in the faith. You Catholics stick to your traditions, but it was condemned right here. Jesus said, you set aside God's commandment for your tradition, and St. Paul said, you predict, some people practice a seductive philosophy according to human tradition. So what about that? Well, here's a, here's a good tip when you're, when you're coming across a, what appears to be a Bible verse uh, that contradicts the teaching of the Catholic Church. Number one is read all of the passage in context. Go back about two verses and read what it really says, what the intent is. And the other very important part is Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. Everything in it is true. So if Jesus was really condemning tradition, then you couldn't have these other verses where we're commanded to be imitators of me. This is St. Paul talking, as I am of Christ. Hold fast to your traditions just as I handed them on to you. And there's many more. Uh, therefore, hold fast to the traditions you were taught, either by oral statement or by a letter of ours. So notice we're talking traditions, not necessarily written, but oral as well, passed on. Um, other verses as well. We instruct you to shun anyone who conducts himself in a disorderly way and not according to the tradition that they have received from us. So obviously there's a difference in the type of traditions we're talking about. Okay, so let's talk about that relationship between scripture and tradition. And Joanne, I borrowed a slide of yours from several years ago. I hope you don't mind. I should have given you credit and a copyright now. <laughs> but we have uh, sacred scripture, and this is what the catechism teaches, the church teaches, that it's literally the speech of God as it is put down in writing under the breath of the Holy Spirit. Um, several other things we know about scripture. Uh, it has God as its author. It was inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's a living document. You know, Scripture itself tells us that the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It, it penetrates even to the dividing of the soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So it's a, it's a living document. It's, uh, it's unlike any other written book in history because the author is God. Uh, it also says all scripture is God breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And more than that, it's a love letter from God to each of us that that shows the the revealing of his love for us and the drawing us back as children of God into his kingdom through his son Jesus Christ. Frank. Yes, when they when they're speaking of tradition in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Corinthians, any of the New Testament, were they only referring back to the Old Testament scriptures? Since the scriptures weren't yeah. really written down in the Bible yeah. yet, so... We'll, we'll, we'll get into that. Oh, okay. um, up until the time of the apostles, the Bible as we know it didn't exist. All they had was the Old Testament. I might add the 46 books of the Old Testament that were called the Septuagint, which Christians, uh, well, I should say, uh, Jewish and Christians later uh, always used as the source document for the Old Testament all the way from 300 BC before Christ. Uh, the official list of 46 books was the Septuagint. That's what Christians always use. But you're right, there was no New Testament until about 400 years uh, after Christ. So it's a good point. That's what they had. So, how did they transmit the truth then? It was done orally through the teaching of the apostles and their successors. Um, because it's a, a living, a living uh, book, Father John said something to Mass a couple weeks ago. He said, you know, he's got the Bible that he reads every day, and he said he never closes it. You know, to close a Bible, to close the Word of God is making kind of a statement. So he makes sure that he reads the Bible, but he always leaves it open so the Word of God can speak to him. And I thought that's a, that was a, a beautiful way to, to think about Scripture. Okay, and then we talk about sacred tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God which has been entrusted to the apostles by Christ the Lord and Holy Spirit. 
So what Frank just uh, mentioned in there, there was no New Testament at the time. So the, the apostles and their successors had to take the fulfillment of the Old Testament, the commands of Christ to go and baptize, and spread it to the world. Um, so we already saw the scripture verse that says, you must uh, pass along your traditions, whether oral or written, uh, to the world. The importance of sacred scripture, um, St. Augustine said this, ignorance of scripture is ignorance of Christ. He also said that the New Testament lies hidden in the Old, and the Old Testament is unveiled in the New. We have an advantage being Christians this late in the game that we can look back on those writings of the prophets in the Old Testament and see the development and the foreshadowing of Christ all the way through it. They didn't have that advantage when they were, when they were back in the Old Testament days. So we can look back and we can see the New Testament being revealed in the Old and the Old Testament being revealed in the New. What are some examples? Uh, manna in the desert. What, uh, what would be the New Testament the equivalent of manna in the desert, the Eucharist. The Eucharist, okay. Um, what else? Some of the Old Testament imagery that found itself in the, in the New Testament. Snake on the pole. The snake on the pole. Like Moses had. Okay. Everybody got bit by a snake, just said, look up to the, what the God said to erect on this pole, the snake on a okay. pole, and they would be uh, survived. Yeah. Okay. And we have the cross to look up okay. to. But anyway, that's uh, it's something that is beyond the scope of what we're talking tonight, but. It's called typology, Old Testament types. You can look at the Ark of the Covenant, um, which went before the people carrying uh, the real presence of God, um, the Ten Commandments in Rod's, uh, uh, Aaron's rod, which is a, a symbol of authority. Uh, what would, and it was called, uh, called the God Bearer, the Ark of the Covenant, because it actually had the real presence. What is the New Testament equivalent of the Ark of the Covenant? that bore Christ into the world and was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit with the same verses that was used in the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. Mary. Mary. And that's a, that's, a, that's a fascinating study. What do they make? <laughs> okay. okay. So um, the Old Testament, as God laid it out, was deliberately oriented so that it should prepare uh, for and declare the prophecy of the coming of the Christ. That's a quote from the Catechism. A uh, good example of this, um, we have the road to Emmaus in your handout from uh, this lesson in there. I was glad to see that in Luke 24. Remember after Christ had uh, risen from the dead, we had two of the disciples walking down the road to Emmaus, and all of a sudden somebody appears next to them and says, what are you discussing? And they're talking about, what, are you the only person that's been in Jerusalem that doesn't know what's happened this last week? And they started to, to explain to him. And he's, you know, he's basically baiting him on, saying, well, tell me more. And then finally he says, um, you foolish men, did you not know that the Christ had to suffer these in order to fulfill the prophecies of the Scripture? And then in the beginning, he started at the beginning with Moses uh, and all the prophets. He interpreted to them all the Scriptures, the things concerning himself, and their eyes were opened. And then the next scene, when they arrived at Emmaus, they sit down, they broke bread. When he was at table with them, he took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Yeah, that's powerful. You could probably spend a couple weeks meditating on that right there. But uh, um, he vanished from their sight, and then they said to one another, did not our hearts burn when he discuss the scriptures and open the scriptures to us. Did our hearts not burn as he's, he's doing that? So that's what, uh, that's what meditating on the Old Testament, or the New Testament, the scripture uh, will do to us as well. Okay, sacred tradition we talked about continues transmitting in its entirety the word of God that has been entrusted to the apostles. And here's what's really important. Uh, we call that the deposit of faith. Okay, the deposit of faith is what was given to the apostles, uh, the Old Testament of Scripture, as well as the teachings of Christ himself. So the church's mission, this, oh, by the way, this is Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph one, okay, the very beginning. So the mission of the Catholic Church uh, is to guard the deposit of faith 
uh, and to preserve it and proclaim it. And it must always be faithful to the teachings of the apostles. So we have the Pope today. His mission is not to come up with a new creative spin on Catholic, the Catholic Church and doctrine in our customs and practices. It's to pass along faithfully what was received from Jesus and the apostles. Uh, to, to pass along faithfully and without error. Um, so that is the, that's the purpose of uh, guarding the deposit of faith. And as Pope John Paul II says, there is no real formation of Christian intelligence with uh, constant recourse to the tradition of our fathers in the faith. Okay, so there's the uh, Bible and tradition. You can't have you can't have a meaningful interpretation of scripture without a teacher. And that same teacher is the Holy Spirit that guides the church and the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writers of sacred scripture. So the catechism here says the task of giving authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether it is written or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. So we call that teaching authority, the magisterium, uh, the Catechism also says the Magisterium is not superior to the Word of God, but it's sermon. It teaches only what has been handed on to it. So as Pope John Paul II said, the mission of the church is to teach the gospel to every generation anew. Okay? Every generation needs to hear the gospel as it's been passed along. Okay, so here's, uh, here's an example of where we are today. We had the road to Emmaus where Jesus is instructing those two disciples. And now we have in the, in the book of Acts chapter 8, uh, we have Philip, uh, disciple Philip. He's, uh, he's standing by the roadside, and the Holy Spirit says, go down and stand by, stand by the road. And uh, so he does that. And here comes an Ethiopian, um, really a, a, whole, a whole band coming along. And it's one of the most powerful um, men in Ethiopia. He's, he's guarding the treasury of the queen. All right. Eunuch. He's a eunuch. And uh, so Philip is standing there, and he sees the chariot come over, and the, the eunuch is, is uh, reading a scroll from... Uh, the prophet Isaiah. He had just gone, he had heard all this about what was happening, and he went to visit the, uh, the temple in Jerusalem, and he's trying to understand the scripture. And Philip walks up and says, do you understand what you are reading? And then Philip asks, and he says, but how can I unless someone explains it to me? And then Philip does the same thing that Jesus did. He sat down and he explained, he opened the scriptures and explained all the way through the Old Testament, the fulfillment of Christ Jesus in the good news. And when he heard that, the eunuch says, he, he, he stopped the whole caravan and he says, there's some water, baptize me. <laughs> so he went down and Philip uh, baptized him in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Then Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, Philip baptized him. And Philip vanished from his sight, I guess on another mission with the Holy Spirit. And the eunuch was praising God and rejoicing as he left. But again, there's an example of uh, the church doing the same mission that Christ did on opening the scriptures and proclaiming the good news. And that's that was done without a New Testament. Um, that was done, and, and it's important to realize too that when Christ left, he didn't leave us the Bible. He left us with a command that says, go and preach the good news to all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That was the command. Okay, uh, what Catholics believe? Okay, tradition versus the, the little t tradition. All right, so if you're trying to talk about what Catholics believe, I've used this slide in uh, some other classes, and it's, I, I think everybody can relate to this. If you've been around the Catholic Church for very long, this is just the first page of the dictionary Catholic dictionary. Now the church has been around 2,000 years and it's a little intimidating if someone were to ask you to go down to say um, First Baptist Church and just give a, a small talk to one of their, their Bible study groups about what Catholics believe. All right. 
where would you start? And uh, use this little cartoon, you kind of feel like this guy right here. <laughs> kind of that sinking feeling. But where would you start? Well, here's, here's a, a real good little diagram. I forgot to bring the book in. Uh, by David Curry, he wrote a book called Born Fundamentalist, Born Again Catholic. And he goes through all of the issues that he faced when he converted into the Catholic Church. And he came up with this diagram. He said, you know, really you can take all the teachings of the church and you can break them into five different areas up here. Uh, the most important being here, the least important back up here. And the sacred deposit of the faith is just what we've been talking about. Those are the truths received by the apostles, the sacred deposit of faith. It includes church authority, the Eucharist, the sacraments, the liturgy, teachings of Christ, and sacred scripture, which in the very beginning would have just been the Old Testament, but eventually became the New Testament as well. We have dogma. These are truths affirmed by the formal councils that have met. Now, in the beginning, very little was written down about the early church, and it wasn't until heresies started creeping in that the church said, whoa, 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 wait a minute. You're teaching that Christ was not God. You're teaching a lot of things. So that was really the beginning of the early church councils. And they met not to put down in writing everything we know, but mainly to counter the heresies that might have sprung up. In fact, the, the model of this in the book of Acts, um, there's the Council of Jerusalem, where there was a, a heresy beginning to spread, where some of the uh, some of the disciples were teaching that in order to become a Christian, you had to become a Jew a Jew first. In order to become a Christian, you had to be circumcised if you're a male. And and all of a sudden, this is getting back to the apostles, and they had they, a council. They came together. Peter headed the council, and they said, "No, it's not necessary. Gentiles can become." Christians without becoming Jewish first. Um, so he says in there, it seemed good to us and to the Holy Spirit that this must be true. So that was the model of, of the councils. All right, since then, there's been 21 councils in the Catholic Church, almost one for every century since the time of Christ. Generally, they've, they've met to deal with the with a heresy going on. One of the very first ones, the Council of Nicaea, um, it was defending against the Arian heresy that denied the divinity of Christ. And it also fixed the date for keeping Easter. That's interesting. How, how, do, how, does, how does the Catholic Church compute the date of Easter? And the first Sunday after the first full moon after the first day of spring. Right. <laughs> wow. He's you ever good. notice yeah. on Easter there's always a full moon, springtime? And the Council of Nicaea. Next time you're talking with uh, maybe somebody who's not Catholic, say, oh, by the way, how do you know when Easter is? Oh, that was proclaimed by the Council of Nicaea, the same one that, that proclaimed the divinity of Christ. But the first Sunday after the first full moon after the first day of spring. First day of spring. Wow. Very good. Extra points. <laughs> okay, and these are the other, con uh, these are other heresies of that. The Third Ecumenical Council. They met talking about Mary. Um, they declared that Mary is truly the mother of God, the Theotokos, which means God-bearer. Uh, and there was a, a Nestorius heresy here uh, proclaiming that, no, Jesus wasn't God. He, be, he was born a man and became God. And uh, now the, the apostles uh, confirmed that Jesus was fully God, fully man from the moment of conception if, in fact, I have to say, this was an issue. When I was leaving the Baptist church, I was walking out, and the secretary, Cindy, said, Bob, you know, I really, I can accept some of the things that the Catholic Church teaches, but calling Mary the mother of God is just not right. She's the mother of Jesus. And my answer was, well, we believe that Jesus is God. If Jesus is God, Mary is the mother of God. And we'll get, on, again, when we talk about Marian uh, theology, Every privilege that Mary has, and you wonder, why does Catholic Church make such a big deal about Mary? It's not because of her, it's because of who her son was. Every privilege that she receives is because of his greatness. And there's, if he was truly, truly God, then she's the only creature 
that ever had that relationship with the Holy Trinity. She was the mother of the second person of the Trinity. She was the spouse of the Holy Spirit and had God as her, her father. No one else could ever proclaim that. Anyway, that was the Council of Ephesus. And then uh, several councils later, we have uh, St. Augustine uh, presiding over the Council of Hippo in Carthage. And that's where the, the Catholic Council said, these are the writings, the inspired writings of the New Testament. So at that time, the New Testament canon, we call it, the list of books became uh, accepted. Okay, uh, and then we get into uh, our doctrine or teachings of the church. They say this is where most of the theologians reside up here and applying pro-life stands, uh, science, ethics, a lot of the, the issues that are going on now in the Catholic Church are up here. Applying uh, the truths of the deposit of faith to everyday living up here. Uh, now you get to the disciplines, which are the rules of daily life. Um, and those are the uh, six rules they call the precepts of the church, going to mass on Sunday, confession, communion, Easter, observing holy days, fasting and abstinence, and supporting the church. And then way out here are devotions, the activities that enhance personal conversion. Okay, the rosary, uh, Eucharistic adoration, praying the chaplet, one of my devotions, the sacred heart uh, devotion, novenas. Where do you think most of the misunderstandings about Catholics come from? At what level? Devotions. Yeah, I'd say way out here, which are not the, you know, so my approach is if somebody has an objection over here, why do you call priest father? Um, you know, why do you, why do you pray the rosary when Jesus said, you know, a vain and repetitious prayer you shouldn't be doing? Um, I'll answer that, but I'll say, but you know, that's not, that's not the center of the Catholic faith. This is the center of the Catholic faith, uh, the sacred deposit of faith. We call the, the deposit of faith and the dogma, the truths without error that can never change the tradition with a capital T. And the others we call a little t tradition, which are forms adapted to different places and times in which the great tradition is expressed. So does so everybody understand the difference between little t tradition and the big t? And I have this on here just to, to show that the central doctrine of the Catholic Church is the Holy Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we'll also see later that the source and summit, the, the source of unity in the Catholic Church, um, radiated from the Eucharist, Jesus giving us his body, blood, soul, and divinity, uh, which is a, a teaching that went all the way back to the time. All right, what do Catholics believe? Uh, probably the easiest way to find out what we believe is what? The Catechism. And I think this was the greatest um, gift that Pope John Paul II gave to us. It was the first Catechism since really the Council of Trent, since the Protestant Reformation. And it's designed to be um, very easy to read as well as very, um, oh, what's, what's the word, um, ecumenical. It, it is written very charitably, whereas some of the early language of, um, of some of the catechisms of the Council of Trent after the Protestant Reformation were condemning those that split from the church. This is a, a, a reconciliatory, or a conciliatory, I guess is the word, Terry. Is that the right word? <laughs> okay. Um, inviting, explaining the Catholic Church very charitably. You can give this to anyone, and it's very, it can be read like a book from front to back on the teachings of the church. It's got an index for topics, uh, as well as scripture study. Um, you can go through the back, the index in scripture as you're doing a Bible study and find out what the church has always believed about that particular verse and where it got its, its teachings from. So it's, I think it's a great document. A uh, little question and answer. The Catechism of the Catholic Church, A, contains major beliefs, B, selected beliefs, or C, is a synopsis of all the truths of the Catholic faith. All the truths. What do you think? Wait. All. C. C. Okay. So there are no secrets. It's, it's all here, all the way back to the origin about what we believe. And the purpose of the Catechism is, okay, A, to make sure Catholics finally know the rules. 
uh, B, explaining the doctrines that have changed since Vatican II, and C, to help each of us come into a living relationship with Jesus Christ. What was Vatican II about? That was in the 60s? Like, what, what like, precipitated it? Well, Karen, maybe you could answer that. What precipitated Vatican II? Uh, Pope uh, John XXIII said to open the windows and let the fresh air into the church, right? Mm -hmm. After his friends, the church became a fortress church. It put up all these walls between us and the rest of the world, us and Protestants. And basically, Vatican II brought all these walls down and opened the church up to the whole world. It was an exciting time to live through, too. We were in high school. And sophomore year in high school, our whole religion class was devoted, the whole year, was devoted to reading the newspapers, watching television reports, and listening to what the Catholic Church was doing. And the Catholic Church was out there in the mainstream um, newspaper reporting on what was happening. And the whole world was watching. Right. What was the town that, that, I mean, what was the town that, was, was it like celebratory, but then the church was? Mm -hmm. And I think it, um, uh, for us, you know, growing up Catholic, um, it gave you a sense of pride in the church um, that you belong to. And it was the first council that they allowed non-Catholics to attend as well. So it was very reconciliatory, and, and they were like, we want non-Catholics to be educated as well. And that's, my dad grew up during that time, and he remembered like, one Sunday the, the mass was in Latin, and then the next Sunday it was like, finally in English. He's like, well, I understand it now. And then, you know, you had lay people up there helping uh, administer the Eucharist. That's true. And that was Right. Yeah. So we turned the elder around so that we were presenting Christ out here on the table for everyone to see. So there was a participation of the whole church rather than all, all of us looking at the back of the priest while he was going through you know, all the motions of the Mass. So it was a breath of fresh air, like Terry said. It was, it was a great opening up, and you really felt... Sort of an <laughs> it was it was definitely an awakening. It was a fresh air. I mean, it was, you know, all of a sudden the church came to life. It wasn't just going through the motions. You know, you didn't feel like you went to Mass and because my mother said you go to Mass whether you want to or not, okay? Uh, it opened it up to the church and it created a feeling that you wanted to go there and see the participation. And you actually were participating in the ceremony that was right. happening um, as you know we grew up as we grew older um, when we were in um, Catholic University um, we joined a, a group of it, the exercise in Christian living and it was very similar to CHIRP and we would all get together on Wednesday evenings and would have mass in the chapel of the university and Father would say Mass, and we were all there in the sanctuary around the altar with the guitar and singing, and it just made the Catholic Church for teenagers and young adults come alive. Before Vatican II, a good Catholic would pray, pay, and obey, and after Vatican II, we were participating within the whole, uh, whole of the church. Question. Did the church exist before Jesus died or only after Jesus died? I, you can get pretty I, deep I know that one. one scripture where it, uh, in, I think it was Matthew where he talks about you know, <clears throat> Jesus was talking and he says, If you have a dispute with your brother, try to work it out with your brother. If he don't listen and you can't work it out, get two, wit two or three witnesses. And if they don't listen to the witnesses, Take it to the church, and, and if they don't listen to the church, then kick them out like a, and treat them like a Gentile. So to me, that verse means like the, the church was already implemented before Jesus died, since Jesus was talking about the church in that verse. 
but I don't know if that's true or not. Well, I, it, as far as he wouldn't have said church because yeah. if he was Jewish, he would have said temple yeah. or right. synagogue. Right, and that, he, he says church, not temple. Yeah. Well, wasn't that tabernacle? The tabernacle part of the church. Am I wrong? So it makes me believe that the church was already alive before Jesus died. Do you know what um, where you read that at? Like what no, book? No, it's Matthew. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew six. Yeah. Um, to me, the, the, the church was empowered by the Holy Spirit on Pentecost because right. you had the you had the, the, the cowering apostles that all fled during the crucifixion. They're they're in the upper room for nine days praying. The first novena, by the way, novena means nine. Um, and then the, the Holy Spirit descended upon them, empowered them, empowered them to go out into the world and spread the, the gospel. So, to me, the, the Pentecost to me is always yeah, the start I, of the I, church. Now, yeah. Somebody it's might look the up. Birthday of the Catholic Church. The Pentecost, yeah. Birthday of the Catholic Church. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, why Catholics believe what we believe? Okay. So we've got got the catechism, we've got all this oral teaching in there, and you're going to hear this a lot, either from friends or just workers, uh, on any particular doctrine, why do Catholics, why do you believe that? And, uh, that was one of the best tools you gave us. Okay, now here you don't have to play scripture roulette, because you know, as a former Southern Baptist, the scripture will let somebody gives me a verse and say, yeah, but you know, look over here and uh, go over here and uh, you, I think it means this, you think it means this. But the question is, on a disputed verse, on something like tradition or baptism, what did the apostles teach that verse to me? So on any question, the simplest answer about why Catholics believe what we believe is because that's what the apostles taught. And usually it just, it's a huh. And it's, I tell you, there's been many, many conversions of uh, prominent uh, Protestant uh, pastors that have gone back into early church history and studied the, uh, the faith of the early fathers. These were, these were the men and women that were taught by the apostles. And they went out into the world. Many were martyred for the first couple hundred years when Christianity was illegal. They died for their faith. And there are volumes written here about uh, doctrinally what the uh, what the apostles taught, where the, the beliefs came from. It's uh, separated into doctrines. This, this is in three volumes. This this first volume one, Faith of the Early Fathers by Jurgens. This was before the uh, Christianity was even legalized. So this is the very beginning. If somebody said, "Well, yeah, I, I know that this this." Uh, Father of the Church said that that baptism of infants is a tradition we receive directly from from the fathers, but that was that was something that you invented after the Catholic Church went corrupt. Now this everything written in this book was prior to um, the Council of Carthage and Hippo that gave us the New Testament. So those same leaders of the church that gave us the New Testament, if you say that everything they taught up until then was corrupt, then you can't trust the New Testament. You have to at least say, if you're going to say the Catholic Church became corrupt, you're going to have to say it was after the New Testament was given to us, because those same men passed along the apostolic teaching. So anyway, you can take any one of the, uh, the disputed challenges of the Catholic Church. Somebody says, why do you believe this? Um, and you can say that's what the apostles taught. Now, I mentioned to me, uh, what brought me back was to the Catholic Church was the issue of the Eucharist. And when we study in more detail later, John chapter 6 says more about eternal life and Jesus giving us his body, blood, soul, and divinity in the Eucharist than anywhere else in the entire Bible. And I can tell you when I led Bible studies and I attended them in a non-denominational setting, uh, Chapter 6 of John was either never discussed or danced over like hot coals because it is so literal in there. Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up in the last day. 
you don't you don't hear that too much about the you hear about the born again discourse with Nicodemus. You must be born again for eternal life, but no one ever brings this up in here in John chapter six. He who eats my body and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. And we have the words of Jesus at the Last Supper, where he institutes the uh, Eucharist. He says, "This is my body. This is my blood." And I always like to think, consider who's saying that. That's the second person of the Holy Trinity whose spoken word created the universe. <laughs> I mean, it's not a symbol. And uh, even if you were to say that it was a symbol, remember what I said? Somebody says, why do you believe that? That's what the apostles taught. And here we have in scripture here, uh, this is St. Paul speaking like it ought to be obvious. He said, I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? I mean, St. Paul is talking like you ought to know this. And then we go to Ignatius of Antioch, uh, 110. Antioch is the setting for the book of Acts. It's also the first place where Catholics were called Catholics. Uh, and he says, he's referring to those that have fallen away from, from the faith. He says, they abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess the Eucharist is the flesh of our Savior Jesus Christ, uh, flesh which suffered for our sins and which the Father in his goodness raised up again. Uh, Justin Martyr, he was given a martyr for a reason. Uh, he says, the Eucharist is both the flesh and the blood of the incarnate Jesus. Uh, we'll go ahead to the uh, 373 AD. Uh, Athanasius confirms it all the way to 800. It's precisely the same flesh that was born of Mary, suffered on the cross, and rose from the tomb. In fact, the belief in the real presence of Christ in Holy Communion, or the Eucharist, there was never a challenge and a heresy until a thousand years into Christianity was the first heresy that said, no, no, it's not really Christ, it's just a symbol. And that's when one of the councils met to affirm the doctrine of transubstantiation, the changing of body, the bread into the body and blood of Christ. And you'll hear from our non-Catholic brothers and sisters saying that, well, we just invented this in 1000 AD and they'll point to that council. No, the, the council only affirmed what the church had always believed from, from this time. So these, this is the main factor that brought me back. There are, there are many others. Um, Joanne, I think you had you had a discussion there about something that brought you back. Uh, yeah. Um, well, I wanted to say that um, I was the same as Bob, away from the church, and um, someone told me that there was a class here at Holy Trinity that, you know, so anyway, it was Bob's class, so that's why I always consider him so instrumental. So I was just sitting there, and he's going through these truths of the church, and I'm like, wow, this all makes sense to me. And it was like, at that time, I was like, I wanted to do anything but be Catholic, but I could just see that it was unrolling before my eyes. But when he was talking about um, John 6, I went up to him after the class, and he said, um, he goes, well, why don't you do this? He said, pray, and ask the Holy Spirit, read John 6, and ask the Holy Spirit to tell you what he thinks it's saying. So, um, I went home and I actually called my sister-in-law who was kind of going through the same place as me. And I and I said, why don't we do that? Why don't we pray, read John 6, and then we'll see what the Holy Spirit tells us. So I did that and I read it and I just thought, I just became convinced that it was the real presence of Christ. I mean, it was just like, I just thought, oh, now I have to be Catholic because once you believe that, you can't be anything else. So I was so convicted of that. And I called my sister-in-law, and she was like, oh, I don't know. I still think it's, uh, you know, a spiritual thing, you know, it's uh, something in remembrance, but I don't think it's the real presence. I don't think that at all. So I was kind of like flabbergasted because I thought, well, what do you do now? She prayed, I prayed. She's a nice person. I'm a nice person. Who's right? And then it was just what Bob said with, um, I started thinking because I just read St. Ignatius of Antioch who was martyred for his belief in the Eucharist and he, when he was being taken from Antioch to Rome for his martyrdom, he wrote seven letters that still exist to this day and in it is just filled with 
what he had up on the board. It just the, it's the body and blood of Christ. It's the real presence. We believe that. We've always believed that. And it made me think that Ignatius of Antioch was actually a student of um, John the Apostle. So I thought, John, who was an apostle of Christ, who was at the Transfiguration, who was at the, um, the only apostle that was faithful at the cross, and I thought, John, who wrote John himself, believed it was the real presence, and that's what he taught. So I thought, that made me see where tradition comes in and where these things come in. It doesn't matter what I think or you think or what you figure out. It matters what the church, what Jesus taught, what the apostles taught, and what the Catholic Church has always remained faithful to. So that really sealed it for me that... Um, and there was no place else to go. So anything else I had problems with in the Catholic Church, I thought, I'm just gonna study this to find out. But it really made a huge impact on me to see that the church has taught what it believes from the very beginning. Well, thanks, Jim. How does the Catholic Church interpret the, uh, the, the uh, part of John 6 where it says, he who does not eat my flesh and drink my blood has no life in uh, let's save that for the uh, for the Eucharist discussion. Okay. Uh, exactly the danger of abandoning tradition. Remember, we talked about that that seesaw with the Bible and tradition equally with the church teaching. What about the danger of ripping off tradition over there? And just going with the Bible alone, okay, that's one of the pillars of the, of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, the danger of going it alone, uh, and I think this, this is uh, very informative here. This was a fairly prominent non-Catholic minister. He says, if the, world, if the world lasts, it will be necessary on the account of differing interpretation of Scripture which now exists, that to preserve the unity of the faith, we should receive the Catholic councils and decrees and fly to them for refuge. Okay, so in other words, there's so many different interpretations of scriptures that now exist. In order to preserve the church, we're gonna to have to run back to all those councils and the, the, the decisions of the early church for refuge to keep our sanity. Who do you think said that? Is it Benny Hinn? Or yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was Martin Luther. This was just within his lifetime when he split from the church and everybody became their own pope. Uh, there was chaos in interpreting scripture. Since then, now this is conservative, 20 years ago the number were 25,000 Christian denominations out there now, uh, many of whom interpret scripture 180 degrees out on the verses. And how, how can they be right? The problem is there's no one to teach scripture, and generally in, in the other denominations, uh, church history really begins at Luther. It doesn't begin back at the, at the apostles in the beginning. So it is, uh, I think this is very uh, illustrative of what happens when we take tradition away from scripture. Uh, here's a prediction from 2 Timothy along this line. He says, the time will come where men will no longer put up with sound doctrine, but instead to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers telling them what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Okay, here's a couple you might remember. Uh, have you ever heard of the Da Vinci Code? <laughs> And again, this is what happens when you when you move away from sacred tradition and go it on your own. Okay, so here's um, uh, ABC News special: Jesus, Mary, and Da Vinci. Uh, uh, it says that Jesus Jesus actually married Mary Magdalene, who had a child and left after the crucifixion to protect the bloodline. It was a secret society to protect the uncomfortable. A genetic truth from an oppressive lying Catholic Church in this secret society that also included Leonardo da Vinci. Okay. Um, what do you think? I actually had 
had a friend of mine came over and goes, you know, I learned a lot from that book. And it, it amazed me, flying with Delta, this is like 10, 15 years ago, every person I saw get off in, in a vacation market, you know, where they're going to the beach or they're going somewhere, they were, all, they were all carrying the Da Vinci Code. So the conversation came up more than once, and I actually had somebody tell me, I learned a lot from that book. Like, I didn't know that Jesus had gifts. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Or about the, the papyrus they found yesterday and put it on the news? Oh, yeah. Which one? The papyrus they found uh, from ancient, yeah. and they okay. said it probably a couple hundred years A.D., but it says Jesus, and, and it gave some script, it had Jesus' name on there, and it said, my wife, mm -hmm. on it. And okay. now they're saying, see, Jesus had a wife. Yeah. Well, the problem is that stuff makes it to the headlines, and then when it's shown that it's fake, you never hear about that. Yeah, so, well, yeah. They did, I did hear something, a story on NPR where the, this historian who analyzed it, who was like an expert in Coptic languages or whatever, cautioned that it could be a metaphor. It doesn't mean, you know, she said this doesn't mean that Jesus had a wife. It could be a metaphor for the church. Yeah. Just like other, just like there are other references to, okay. to the church as his wife. That's good, but the so great, that exactly what we're talking about. How about this one? This uh, 2002, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. The burial box uh, may be that of Jesus' brother, one expert says. This is National Geographic, October 21st. And everybody says, oh, that, well, that's cool. The only problem is the Catholic Church has always taught that Jesus had no siblings. I was just going to say. Mary, uh, after the virgin birth, remained a virgin. She had no other children. So something like this seems innocent, but, you know, why do we... Why do we make such a big deal that Mary remained a virgin after she bore Jesus? Why do we make a big deal about that? I mean, it wouldn't affect the virgin birth. The reason we make a big deal about it is because it's true. <laughs> and that's what the apostles taught from the very beginning, as a matter of fact. So uh, this was inscribed on it, uh, James, the son of Joseph, brother of Jesus. Okay, so I was kind of following that one, and then not even a year later, the Jerusalem Post or someplace says a stone box touted as the oldest archaeological evidence of Jesus is in fact a well-crafted fake in Israeli archaeology uh, experts say. You don't read about this that will make the headlines. But it just kind of shows you that, that prediction by Timothy that there will come a time when men will no longer put up a sound doctrine. They'll just turn aside the myths and it, it's all over. I mean you've seen it. This is just a small example of it. So here's um, one of the church fathers said this. He said, um, there's a twofold test of a teacher you should listen to. Uh, first of all, if a teacher's teaching, can you trace his authority to Peter? You know, somebody claims to be an expert and they're coming up with some of these theories. Can you trace his authority to teach to Peter? So here we are in, uh, here we are in Holy Trinity Catholic Church in Peachtree City, Georgia. And who's our teacher here, teaching authority, our pastor, Father John Murphy? Okay, where did he get his authority? From Archbishop Wilton Gregory. Where did he get his authority? From the Pope, Pope Benedict XVI, who is the 264th successor to St. Peter. It's a small list. You know, you could put those 264 people in the first 10 rows of Holy Trinity in Mass. <laughs> but it's a, it's a line of succession for authority. So that's number one for a teacher in order to even be heard. Uh, in the early church, what did they do? They came in, uh, people that were interested in hearing the gospel came in. They didn't just go off to different groups. They said, who's your bishop? You know, who's the, who's the teacher here that has been with the apostles and has, has some credentials? The other thing is... Can you trace the doctrines that, that people are teaching to the, to the apostles? Can you teach, in other words, are there any new teachings that, that the apostles didn't teach? And we know here that Galatians, um, St. Peter says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one that we preach to you, let him be under God's curse. And that's what we believe is that revelation, divine revelation, ended with the death of the last apostle that there is no more this this is this is it so there, there aren't going to be any new doctrines uh, the fullness of jesus christ has been revealed full in the fullness of god and salvation has been revealed in jesus christ 
That's it. So if somebody comes along with a new trendy doctrine, like gold tablets being brought down from heaven and then taken back, uh, <laughs> uh, then we just can't listen to it. It's uh, there's no credibility there. Uh, these are this is kind of humorous. I love this, uh, and we're wrapping it up now. Uh, tradition means giving votes to the most obscure of all classes, our ancestors. Tradition refuses to submit to the arrogant who merely happen to be walking around. <laughs> Chesterton was a, was a great sarcastic writer there. And then we have St. Augustine, when we tire of a world that is constantly changing, we turn to look at the church which never changes. That's, that's a beautiful comment. And then another one, Cardinal Newman, the world accuses the church of being rigid and unchanging. What a compliment. <laughs> okay, and um, I'd like, you know, when, when Jesus gave Peter the keys, you know, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, and the, it, the greatest testimony to the Catholic Church is that it's there after 2,000 years. And what she teaches is the same as it was taught back in the Apostles. So apostolic uh, tradition has caught the test of time. I got to do this. This is your test. Why do Catholics? Uh, why do Catholics believe these different things? The simplest answer is always what? The apostles taught us that. All right. I'm going to test you here. Okay. Why do we believe that Jesus is really present in the Eucharist? Uh, why? <laughs> I love doing this. Why do we believe that, that the Pope? Um, that Peter was uh, the first among the apostles and authority was given to him. That was the apostles. Why do we believe that baptism is more than just a symbol? It, it really infuses the soul with sanctifying grace. That's what the apostles thought. Why do, we, um, why do we believe the central form of worship is the Mass? That's what the apostles thought. In fact, Justin Martyr, uh, who we already quoted up there back in 300, wrote one of the emperors that was curious about what, how do Christians worship? And he said, this is how we do it. On the day of the sun, we come together, and he gave an entire description of the mass as it is today, including the breaking of bread and the dismissal uh, of those taking the Eucharist to the sick, um, the, uh, the apostles' teachings, and then the sermon, uh, exactly the way the mass uh, is set up today. Uh, why do we confess our sins to a priest, and not just by ourselves directly to God? That's what the apostles taught us. But that's, uh, that's something that really, yeah, really is important to me. Okay, now scripture study resources. I really don't have too much planned here. I'd like to get your ideas because you're probably as involved in scripture as I am. I know that personally, in my days in the Baptist church, the, the, the version of scripture that I uh, just came to love because it's written so clearly and forcefully is the NIV Bible. The only problem is it's... It's a non-Catholic Bible. It's missing the seven books that were taken out during the Old Testament or during uh, the Reformation. Um, but the, the wording is beautiful. I've, I invested a lot of time and tears and highlighting, and I just always come back to this because I know what page to look for verses on. But there are many other good Bibles, the uh, Catholic RSV, the New American Bible. Any others that anybody use? The Jerusalem Bible. Okay. Jerusalem I like Bible. the way uh, it flows. Um, I uh, also, one time I got the one-year Bible. I thought, well, this is good. I got the NIV version. And I kept it next to the bed. And every day, every night before going to bed, I'd open it up. Though I should have had it open already, right? And, and I, it had a verse from the Old Testament. It had a psalm and a verse from the New Testament. And you do that every night for a year, and you've gone through the entire Bible. I don't do that anymore because there's a better Bible study. It's called the Mass. And if you take a look at the first half of the Mass, it's exactly what it does. It always, if you go to daily Mass, you will have covered virtually the entire Bible over a three-year period. All the major parts of the, of the Bible. <clears throat> every year, for uh, every third year, they alternate the different readings of the Gospels. Um, you, it's the best Bible study going because you get to hear the Word, read along if you like, and then you get to hear the sermon, which is the really the oral tradition of the church uh, expounding upon the scriptures and applying it to our lives. So I think that's, that's uh, one of the best. Um, 
There's another one that I really like. If you happen to be in a, a mixed uh, non-denominational Bible study group, and, and I really think that there's no such thing as non-denominational, somebody's going to do the teaching in the, in the group. Uh, but it's called the Navarre Bible, the Navarre Bible. And you can be in any scripture study in here, uh, studying, uh, this happens to be the Catholic epistles, which are, oh, Galatians, Ephesians, uh, James, um, and several others. You can be following along, right along with the study. And if you're in a, a mixed non-denominational group, it's kind of funny because you'll, you'll eventually get to a point where you stumble upon a real tough verse and conversation will go, uh, what do you think that means? And you'll hear all the different uh, inputs, which are, are, are valid. And then, then the conversation will die out. And what I'll do down here is look down and quote what St. Ambrose or St. Augustine said or St. Teresa of Lisieux and, and all of the, uh, some of the doctors of the church expounding on that verse. And I'll say, well, th this is what, what they said. And the eyes just, wow, that's beautiful. Where did you get that? I actually had, I had one guy... Uh, uh, Russ Brioff, who is very involved in the Shroud of Turin, he's a Presbyterian. I was quoting once on one of the scriptures from St. Augustine, and he snatched it out of my book, oh, sorry, snatched it out of my hands and goes, where do you get this good stuff? <laughs> <laughs> and, and what I had to tell him is this is what the church has always meant that verse to be. This is what the saints commented on. So uh, a good Catholic commentary is good. Uh, I mentioned the catechism being very useful in cross-referencing what scripture and the catechism teach. Uh, what else? Any others uh, that you found beneficial in Bible study? Catholicism for dummies. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's not a physical book. It's an online resource, but it's called the Blue Letter Bible. And what you can do is uh, it, it pulls from the Septuagint, so you can go and find the original Greek for the word. Okay. So, you know, since English is a very... <clears throat> Uh, very weak language in a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. So we use life as one word, but there's like very many different Greek versions of the word life. You can go back and be like, oh, well, Jesus uses the word life in this verse, but what was it in the Greek? And, you know, it could be bios or it could be zoe. And so it's, it's cool investigating words. Mm -hmm. It's called the Blue Letter Bible. Right. And the whole history of the Old Testament is interesting. You think, well, how did Greek, what's that have to do with Aramaic and Hebrew in the time of Jesus? But it was actually after the first five books of the Torah uh, that Moses handed on, the prophets and the writings of the prophets came along, and they kind of had the same problem as the early church did with writings, and, and the Catholic Church had to decide which of the inspired writings in the New Testament were actually inspired and deserved to be called Scripture. Well, the, the same thing was happening in the Old Testament. There were, there were a lot of uh, traditions being passed along and writings, and it was actually a descendant of Alexander the Great, uh, Ptolemy, I think was, was the name, uh, that decided that he wanted to add every book in the world, every known book in the world, to the Alexandrian library. And uh, he was the Greek king of Egypt. So he says, okay, the, uh, the, the scripture, the Jewish scripture, sacred tradition is, is, very, uh, is very important. So but he had this problem of what to include in the book. So he had 70, or some say 72, Jewish rabbi scholars came to Egypt, and he put them all in different cubicles, isolated them. They had all the writings in there, and he goes, okay, I want you to tell me which are the reliable books, and I want you to translate it in, into, the, uh, into the, the real translation so you all agree. They went into this, the different rooms and cubicles. They worked, they came out with the same books, the same translations. So he said, okay, we've got it. And that's what is called the Septuagint, which means from the 70, from the 70, the Septuagint. So Ptolemy translated all into Greek, and it was a great benefit for the, the Jewish people, the Israelis, because now they had a really reliable, accurate translation. So they just converted it back over into Hebrew and Aramaic. But the point is, there are 46 books in the Septuagint. There were 46 books for the 300 years prior to Jesus. Whenever Jesus quoted the Old Testament, it was always from the Septuagint. He always quoted from that version. The early church 
only use the Septuagint is scripture. That's, that's what the written scripture was, that was the Septuagint. So there are 46 books at the time of Christ, 46 books for the early church, 46 books in scripture up until Luther. Luther took seven books out of it, and we still use the 46. Okay, so that's, you know, you'll hear a lot of times that the Catholics added seven books to the Bible. No, not quite. It's, it's the other way around. So uh, that's, that's one, one discussion point that does come up.